This is a summary of the ACOG Practice Bulletin for November 2017 titled Vaginal Birth After Caesarean Delivery. It replaces the one from August 2010. Let's review the terms used here. We're talking about patients with previous caesarean deliveries. When it comes time for delivery, they can be divided by their intent, those who will try labor and those who will proceed directly to elective repeat caesarean delivery or simply TOLAC, trial of labor after caesarean, or elective repeat. Here we are dividing them according to what they will do. Ultimately, we will classify them by what happens or the result. Here, there are three categories. VBAC, which is vaginal birth after cesarean, failed TOLAC, and elective repeat. If the outcomes in these groups were all the same, this wouldn't be worth talking about. The outcomes aren't the same. The bulletin points out correctly, I believe, quote, the appropriate clinical and statistical comparison is by intention to deliver. TOLAC versus elective repeat, end quote. Not by result, VBAC, failed TOLAC, or elective repeat. However, it also points out that no randomized trials comparing maternal or neonatal outcomes between women attempting TOLAC and those undergoing repeat cesarean section exist, end quote. We don't need to spend any time discussing why randomization to the groups would be far more valuable than observational studies of patients who pick their groups, but that's what we've got. Clinical considerations and recommendations. This is the part of the bulletin where a specific question is asked and the evidence is evaluated. First question, what are the risks and benefits of TOLAC? Most maternal morbidity occurs when a cesarean section becomes necessary, making failed TOLAC worse than elective repeat and VBAC better. Most of the increased morbidity comes from uterine dehiscence or rupture. A limitation of the literature is that the terms dehiscence and rupture are not defined consistently and often used interchangeably. Time for the usual digression here to talk about dehiscence and rupture. You might be one of those people who looks up words when you think someone is using the word wrong only to find that the dictionary says both ways are acceptable, even if they're completely different. Well, it's like that here, and looking it up probably won't help, but here is the most conventional understanding. A dehiscence is a separation of a suture line. Some disrupted anatomy that was reapproximated surgically has become no longer approximated. A rupture is a complete breach of a barrier between two spaces like the abdominal wall or the bowel wall or the uterine wall. It can be spontaneous, like a ruptured appendix. It can be of a surgical wound, which may include several suture lines. Evisceration refers to a small subset of disruptions leading to bowel outside the abdominal cavity. This may require peritoneal dehiscence if it was closed fascial dehiscence, and skin dehiscence. Let's talk about the layers separating the fetus from the abdominal cavity. Assuming no overlying placental in the area of the previous uterine scar, the layers are amnion, chorion, both of these are fetal, decidua, which is maternal, myometrium, and serosa, or visceral peritoneum. The suture line reapproximated the myometrium. Some may suture the visceral peritoneum also. A classic rupture involves disruption of all of these layers. Obviously, since one of them was a suture line, the myometrium, the rupture involved a dehiscence of the myometrial closure. Fetal extrusion is a subset of ruptures in the same way evisceration is a subset. It requires disruption of all layers. Dehiscence of the myometrial closure without disruption of the amnion and visceral peritoneum is commonly referred to as a window, with two transparent layers intact but allowing viewing of the fetus. Clinically, the most catastrophic scenario is uterine rupture with placental extrusion. The myometrium contains the maternal vessels. Disruption leads to maternal bleeding and may interrupt the supply to the intervilla space the same way a retroplacental hematoma does with abruption. A rupture in the absence of attached placenta may not be catastrophic as the placental circulation is intact, 
but can behave much like a cord prolapse as the fetus and cord push through a small opening. The bulletin acknowledges that the distinctions aren't clear and that both can range from being asymptomatic to symptomatic and clinically significant. For this document, when they talk about these entities, they are talking about, quote, symptomatic or clinically significant events, end quote. This occurs in about 0.7 of TOLAX after one previous C-section. So, to answer the original question, the benefits are that a successful VBAC has lower rates of hemorrhage, infection, thromboembolism, and has a shorter recovery time. The main risk for TOLAC is failed TOLAC, and the most significant risk there is uterine rupture, which is about 0.7%. Next, what is the vaginal delivery rate for TOLAC? The generally accepted rate is 60 to 80%, but that is affected by some demographic characteristics, like age, race, BMI, and some obstetric characteristics, like the reason for the first C-section, spontaneous versus induced labor, gestational age, etc. The most widely used is that developed by the MFMU network for singletons with one previous C-section using information available at the first prenatal visit. Although no models have shown improved patient outcomes, the model may be used to facilitate patient counseling. Next, who are the candidates for TOLAC? Patients who have had one low transverse cesarean section and have no contraindications to vaginal delivery, like previa, are good candidates. Patients with previous classical or T incisions are not candidates. However, individual circumstances must be considered in all cases. For example, one of these patients presenting in advanced labor. And we'll get more into that when we talk about the management in the next section. The risks of TOLAC should be weighed against the benefits as well as the chance of success. If the chance of success using a predictive model is less than 60 to 70 percent, the patient's risks are probably higher than for an elective repeat. That doesn't mean a low score is a contraindication and the patient may choose. Okay, the next question comes up a fair amount. How many previous cesarean sections before someone is not a good candidate for TOLAC? Remember, that's the whole theme of this practice bulletin. A good candidate for TOLAC is the patient in whom the risks and benefits can be quantified, and the conclusion is that the TOLAC is as safe or safer than a scheduled repeat. You need evidence attesting to the safety of TOLAC, or you don't get into the group of good candidates. A common scenario is the patient who had a section for one reason or another, particularly for what she sees as a one-off reason, like breach or a non-reassuring fetal heart tracing. Then she gets repeat sections for the next two, but never really felt like her provider gave her a choice, and looking back, thinks she didn't really need a C-section and doesn't want section number four. What do you tell her? Two large studies offer some conflicting results. One found the risk of uterine rupture similar in women with one versus multiple sections, but the other showed a risk of uterine rupture of 0.9 with one and 1.8 with two sections. Both studies found increased morbidity with more than one section, but the differences were small. The conclusion is that one or two previous C-sections still allow the patient to get into the, quote, good candidate group. Quote, data regarding the risk for women attempting TOLAC with more than two previous C-sections are limited, end quote. All right, macrosomia. Not surprisingly, having the first section for dystocia, if the next baby is bigger, chances for success are lower. But the conclusion is that suspected macrosomia does not prelude TOLAC. Same thing for gestational age greater than 40 weeks. It might decrease the chances of success, but it doesn't preclude TOLAC. How about previous low vertical incision? There aren't good data suggesting that uterine rupture is higher, so the bulletin says, recognizing the limitations of available data, the provider and patient may choose to proceed with TOLAC in the presence of a documented prior low vertical uterine incision, end quote. That said, here's my two cents. The reason I don't like doing TOLACs 
with the previous low vertical are two. One, there is an agreement in obstetrical texts about what the definition of a low vertical is. And two, just because the intent was low vertical, I'm not sure what they ended up with. Starting with the definition, the low vertical is vertical, but still in the lower, non-contractile portion of the uterus. A classical incision involves the fundus, which is the contractile portion and has a significantly higher risk of rupture. The problem is that the contractile and non-contractile portions are not well demarcated. Some texts actually say that it is a low vertical if it ends before the level of the round ligaments. They may not have noticed that the round ligaments attach to the uterus at the tippy tippy top of the uterus. Alright, here's my theory on how to figure it out, and keep in mind that the bulletin doesn't say this. If you do an ultrasound on a pregnant uterus, the uterine wall is about 5 millimeters thick, everywhere, the front, the back, the top. When you sew up a low transverse incision, you notice the edges, both top and bottom edges, are still about 5 millimeters thick. Maybe the top is a little thicker, but not much. When you sew a classical incision, the edges, left and right, are much thicker, like 20 to 30 millimeters. They went from 5 millimeters to 30 millimeters because the myometrium contracted, suggesting you've entered the contractile portion. So I guess if you make a vertical incision and the edges are thin, you're in the non-contractile portion and you succeeded in creating a low vertical incision. Woohoo! I've started every vertical incision as a low vertical and ended up every single time with thick edges. I tell the patient that I entered the contractile portion and do not recommend TOLAC. Phew, I'm done with that. But the practice bulletin says it's fine as long as you tell her the data is limited. How about when you don't know if it's vertical or transverse? The studies cited by the Bolton found no difference in the rates of uterine rupture between transverse incisions and unknown incisions. They admit that this is probably because most of the unknowns are actually transverse incisions. They conclude that if there's one previous incision, but it is of unknown type, it's okay. Okay, unless you have a high suspicion that it was vertical. The example cited being a previous c-section on a very preterm fetus. When it comes to twins, it's the same with, as with the unknown incision. One previous incision, twins this time around, okay to TOLAC. Obesity? Well, the success rate for VBAC drops from about 85% to 60% in those with a BMI over 40, but repeat cesarean section is riskier in obese patients. Bottom line, obesity is not a contraindication to TOLAC. Okay, let's summarize who's a candidate for TOLAC. Most patients with one previous low transverse incisions are candidates for TOLAC. That includes twins, previous low verticals, unknown incisions, big babies, and big moms. Patients who aren't candidates are those with a high risk for uterine rupture, including previous classical incisions, T incisions, and extensive transfundal surgery as in transmural myomectomies entering the cavity. Then there is a group of in-betweeners. You know, the only ones you had a question about and need the most guidance. Not surprisingly, little guidance is provided, obviously because the data is most limited here. Here, we find those with two previous transverse incisions. In general, it's okay, but you should, quote, counsel them based on the combination of other factors that affect their probability of achieving successful VBAC, end quote. So with this group, maybe the presence of twins or macrosomia may make you lean toward repeat C-section. Bottom line, counsel. One, chance of success. Two, risk of rupture. Low but limited data. And three, benefits. Next time, we'll finish up with management of patients deemed to be good candidates.